We can expect an unimaginable time of trouble in the last days, such as the world has never seen before. That's what Scripture tells us. But we need not be afraid. His word shaping our story. The year was August 1948, and a young preacher, George Vandeman, was preparing to take the pulpit. As he did so, a Sabbath hush fell over the new grounds as members mixed gratitude with happy hearts for the work accomplished and for their new auditorium. That was 70 years ago, and Central California Conference continues the legacy of Soquel Camp Meeting today. Soquel, an embodiment of America's camp meeting, has become a timeless tradition of faith intersecting with culture, pleasure bursting with praise, and truth uniting with tradition. It is camp meeting time once again. We invite you to join us as we worship our Creator together and let our stories and the stories that are yet to come be shaped yet again. Born and raised in East Los Angeles, Pastor Jose Vicente Rojas serves as president of Movementum, a ministry that exists to improve the corporate cultures of churches, administrative entities, and community organizations through the development of servant leaders. Movementum reaches across cultural, ethnic, and linguistic lines to inspire and train a new generation of servant leaders, resulting in more effective evangelism, youth ministry, and church administration. A musician and recording artist, Jose has authored several books and is best known around the world as a passionate speaker and preacher of the word. He holds a bachelor's degree in religion and a master's degree in religion with emphasis in sociology from Loma Linda University. He is still madly in love with Ruthie, his wife of over 37 years, and their four grown children, Veronica, Angelica, Gabriel, and Maria. Please welcome Jose Rojas. Good morning. You are faithful. You are what they refer to as the diehards. Came to camp meeting, get out of my way. You had your breakfast, some of you are still burping. Welcome to camp meeting. Once again, I must say I'm honored to be home. I really do feel at home. This is home. This is family. You've taken care of me since I was 15 years old. I think that qualifies. My mama says that Soquel has had me longer than she did. That says a lot. <laughs> I only got to live at my house, at my parents' house, till I was 14. And so began the journey, Monterey Bay Academy and all the other places till I met my spouse. And I never again went home. And so my mom says, that Central California family of yours had you longer than I did. I pray that the Lord bless you this camp meeting. Now, there's going to be a lot of seminars, so there's something for everybody. So if you're uh, uh, interested in prophecy, you'll take those seminars. If you're interested in health, you'll take those seminars. You take what you need to have. We don't all have the same gifts. We don't all do the same things. But there is enough stuff on the schedule that whatever you need, you can get at camp meeting this year. Then my part today is to have a teaching seminar that gives you practical suggestions for living. So these are theological constructs for those who care about theology. They are also thoughts and meditations for those who love their morning watch. I, I attempt to speak to four people, only four, and all of them are nine years old. Ellen White said, if a pastor could speak so that a child can understand, then the pastor has fulfilled their duty. So I could speak to you on the seven uses of Logos and the Pauline correspondence, do you know what I just said? About three of you, amen, finally. <laughs> See, that's theological construct. Or I could tell you about the seven times that Paul talked about Jesus as the I am, as the, as the word. As, then you say, oh, oh, I would like that too. So a pastor could find a way 
to say it so that a child can understand, then everybody's blessed. Does that make sense? Yes. And, and so when I preach in the mountains of some of the third world countries I've had the joy of visiting, and I'm, I'm speaking to audiences who never attended a day of school in their life, they don't read, they don't write, but they love the Word of God and someone to explain it to them. And to have them understand physics by the end of the series, how E equals MC square, energy is equal to mass times the speed of light in a vacuum squared, and how that applies to eternity, and have peasants saying, amen, I got every word of that. Then I fulfill my assignment. See what I'm saying? Amen. Ellen White says that Jesus could speak the deepest, most profound theological con concepts and confound the doctors of the law in Jerusalem from the age of 12. And yet he could go out into the countryside and the humblest peasant would receive the same message and understand it. Amen. So here's the, since I'm giving away, some of you will be buying these recordings just to get the stuff off of my methodologies. I'm giving away my methods. I used to have a Facebook account that was nearing 100,000 followers, and I had just as many enemies signing on. You know what it's like to get up to 2,000 attacks in one day? I started getting sick. Oh, Pastor, you could take it. Yeah, how many do you get? Well, maybe one a week. That's one paper cut. <sighs> Blow on it, wash up, put a Band-Aid, and you're fine. Try 2,000 paper cuts in one afternoon. You'll bleed to death. I, 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 I was confronted with a concept. Do I want followers? No. Lord didn't call me to create followers. He's the one we follow. We don't follow humans. We follow the Son of God. You could have your favorite preacher, but don't, don't get carried away because favorite preachers died too. There was division in the early church because there were followers of pa Barnabas and there were followers of Paul. And, well, you know, and, and that's how, what happens with me and another speaker. He's a worldwide evangelist as well. And, and it's either him or me around the planet. Well, if you can't get him, you get Rojas. If you can't get Rojas, you get him. In the Latino world, there's 33 countries. We're the two guys. And, and I tell them, you shouldn't do that. And I get scolded. You should speak like Pastor so-and-so. He's more mature. He's more gentle. He's more, what's this barking and roaring at us? You should calm down and be more like him. And what they don't know is that he and I are very close. I said, I've been told I need to preach more like you. And he bursts into laughter. I said, what's so funny? I can't tell you how many people have told me, you need to preach more like Rojas. He's excited. He's excitable. You're so boring and monotone. <laughs> you see, everybody has their favorite. Just listen to the Word of God. Amen. See, we have another bad habit. You don't mind if I'll repeat some of this stuff later when the crowd's larger? Do I have your permission for that? Don't be turning tonight and saying, you know, we heard that this morning. And he just repeats everything. So I'm asking for your permission. Is it okay if I repeat some of this for the evening meeting? And tomorrow morning when the crowd's here, there's nowhere to hide but to be confronted in Jesus. Brothers and sisters, we need mature Christians to rise to the surface. We don't need to follow anybody. Just follow Jesus. So I speak to four people. One are the auditories. These are the people that need to hear truth. They're like this. Mm -hmm. Oh, I like that. That was uh, the use of Hebrew was sterling. Mm -hmm. Yes, Ellen White did say that. Second Selected Messages, pages 234 and 35, paragraphs 4 and 6. She did say that. Auditory people listen. All they care about is truth and information scholarly pursuit, evidence. Do they have any patience for big mustaches? No. Do they have any patience for kids and their music? No. All they care about is hearing truth. They must be fed. Now, I have two dissertations. I didn't have the $170,000 to finish those two doctorates, but I have the research done. And they gave me a doctorate of divinity uh, for my work with government.
I don't know what divinity and government have to do with each other. But anyway, I did go to school. I can write my name, legibly. <laughs> and I'm always thinking of the auditories in the audience. They need to be fed. So I give depth and scholarly premise. In the middle of a message, most of you didn't catch it. Amen, whatever it was. <laughs> Amen. But the scholarly person, look at that. Without even mentioning the Greek, he did the best Greek insert I've ever heard. <laughs> See, so I need to feed who? The auditories. Then there's another person sitting in this audience, and they are the kinesthetics. The kinesthetics are the emotional people. They have to feel it all. Oh, I love this preacher. I could just feel the Holy Spirit moving freely in the auditorium. Look at it. <laughs> Don't you feel it? What does the auditory say? No. I just need to hear truth. But the kinesthetic needs to feel. The auditory needs to hear. Then there's the visual. Why doesn't he use a pulpit and stay put like everybody else? Have you noticed? I'm always moving. TV crews go crazy. Oh, you got to cover Rojas. We'll pray for you. Because I'm moving, I'm restless, and if the studio is small, they go crazy. The jib finally just drops there and doesn't move for the rest of the program. Because I, I'm, and if I talk about the world, I say, it's huge. Can you see it? The visuals are, and, and, and they want to see it all. So I need to give them something, something to see. What do the auditories feel? He needs to calm down. Just give us the information, please. What are the uh, kinesthetics? I, I can't tell you what I feel. <laughs> but he's moving so much, I can't even tell you how I feel. You get it? Then there's the fourth person. No one ever thinks of them. And it's the musicals. Musicals are the ones that have the music on all day. They're not even listening to it. It's just kind of background, like when you go to J.C. Penney's. It's always at the house. You walk in. Well, that's a pretty song. It's my favorite. And they're always singing. Da 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 da. Da da da. While they're doing their work at the house. Da 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 da. -da. Even the dog. She's always da da da. <laughs> oh, oh. See, now I just did something for visuals. He actually barked during the morning message. <laughs> Auditories, I, I wish he would get to something more meaty now. I'm ready to eat. He hasn't fed me yet. So that's why I'm known as a very strange speaker, because I'm constantly going between those four people. The musicals, the message didn't make sense to them at all until I pulled out my guitar. Amen. Now you know why I use my guitar. Now I'm not going to use it this morning. Reason, if I sing in the morning, I lose my voice. And I'm not willing to compromise on that issue. So we'll sing something together, because musicals will be fed today. Follow? So after the program, auditories will come and say, I was fascinated in part three of your message. You actually know where the partitions are? Yes, I, I'm impressed with your ability to partition your message so effectively. I was impacted. Thank you. That means the guy is freaking out. He loved the message. That means she, you know, in all my research, I had never heard that explained quite that way. I've known that message my entire life, but I have never thought of it that way. The, the visual people, when they have been blessed, they come over here and they tell me, I see it now. <laughs> see, they're literally looking at something. I can see it now. I see. Oh, I see. And the, and the, uh, the, the uh, kinesthetic person? I love the message. I laughed. I cried. I'm a mess. It was wonderful. I could just, I know the Lord was here. I could feel him. The prayer team, we were back there weeping together. Emotional. And this group, all of us have all of that, but we have a strength in one or the other. Follow? And so then the musicals are, where, where did you get that guitar? We had a thing going on back there among the band, and we just want to know. This was in Toronto at camp meeting. 
they have a T-formed tent with 8,000 people in it. I felt like the elephant in the Three Ring Circus. It, well, it was, yeah, it was, anyway. And they had stacks of speakers throughout the audience, the sound guys. And, and there was a musician during my appeal for baptism. I was playing with my guitar, and he's listening to my song and looking at me. Visuals, can you see it? Kinesthetics, I can feel it coming. And auditories, please get to your point. You're wasting valuable time. See how I'm trying to feed all of you? Do you see it? I'm giving away what I have learned in the journey of 42 years of preaching. I was averaging 463 sermons a year. Thank the Lord, I've cut back to about 300 sermons a year now. Camp meeting alone, you're getting 15 out of me this week. And I still had a leader say, can you speak a few more? And I said, no, <laughs> I'm not a robot, I'm a human being. Vocal cords can only last for so long. Agradecemos su paciencia. See, Univision gives it a certain touch, doesn't it? See, the emotionals are feeling it. Oh, that, that was cute. <laughs> I'm being outright because this is a seminar presentation. Do you sense it? I'm not trying to insult your intelligence. I'm giving you my secrets. They should not remain secrets. They're free for anyone to use. Feed your audience. Any educator will tell you these are learning methods. These are how students learn. That's why experiential learning in the classroom is a powerful technique for today's teachers. If the student can experience it, they'll learn more than just hearing it. Cognitive pursuit increases when cognitive stimulation occurs because of physical involvement of the student in the material being covered, because this causes a neurophysiological response, which therefore reaches from uh, uh, frontal lobe into temporal lobe function and reaching the, the limbic system. You understand what I'm saying? Auditories, finally, he finally gave us something to wrap our minds around. You, you should see when I preach to uh, atheists, which are very scholarly, they can prove to you, mind you, prove to you that there is no God. So if I tell us an atheist the Bible says this, are they going to listen to me? No. But when I preach on opening night in the TV commercials where you want to experience God, come on out. This was Seattle. I had a bunch of atheists saying, I got to see this. No, I don't want you to see it. I want you to experience it. My opening message was called The Neurophysiology of God. And it was a neurophysiological evaluation of how the Holy Spirit physically, literally interacts with our minds. And how forgiveness, you can actually chart it with a brainwave monitor. You know when she forgave you, gentlemen? Remember that? Come on, you remember when she forgave you of that. I see all boy, listen, this message is for you. <laughs> because you know what I forgave you of. Remember when she did forgive you? All right. <laughs> I forgive you, but if you do that again, I'll leave you. Okay, 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 okay. See, don't you ever forget to, to water my beans again. All the vines dried up. <laughs> see, what were you thinking of? <laughs> see, and... and when a forgiveness occurs, the brain fires different neural responses. You can actually trace it all the way to the limbic system when forgiveness occurs in the human mind. So then I'm telling the audience, and I built it up physiologically, uh, clinically, uh, and because and, I did my toxicology at Loma Linda. I know that you know that, and I know that you care. Uh, I know you're holding back tears of joy to find out that I did toxicology. Remember I used to bring snakes to the camp? That was real research. I specialized in rattlesnake venom toxicology, and the day came that I was training, doing the in-services for physician groups on patient management after snake bite. So when I, when I get thrown out of the ministry, <laughs> I have another career I can go no, I, I, That will not happen. Auditories are, okay, take us back. See, so, so notice how I'm constantly jumping everywhere. 
Someone called it schizophrenic. I said, no, that's two. This is multiple phrenic <laughs> preaching. <laughs> in other words, it, this, is, this is a constant doing this in my mind. Okay, can you do that? It's Ellen White saying, train the brain to go beyond its current limits. The mind is capable of anything we set our minds to do it. So set your mind on Christ. Give it to Him. And so this multiple something could happen while I'm preaching, and all of a sudden I lose you. Well, I didn't get that part, but amen, out of faith. But someone else is being fed during that part. See, now you get it? And when I have the front row full of children, little ones, okay, the kids, their program starts right now. We don't want to go, and they start crying. And, and afterwards, the little ones, little ones come up and hug my leg. And they say, you're funny. No, you're funny. Uh-uh, you're funny. Uh-uh, you're funny. No, ask my mommy, you're funny. <laughs> there are kids now in their 20s. Pastor, just need to say something. You're funny. <laughs> it started when he was four. <laughs> We're not going to settle it till I win this. <laughs> See, when you reach a child... You've reached everyone. Okay, you have the premise for the rest of today? So when you see me uh, feeding the other, you be patient. Your turn is coming. Briefly, quickly, what is hope? What is hope? Just shout it. I heard something. Everything. Hope is everything. Yeah, that means she's your niece. She's wonderful, and her name is Hope. She is everything in this family. Okay, what is hope as a... Something good's going to happen? Desire. Desire, someone in the back said? Trusting without seeing, expectation. Believing the tortilla is getting warmer. Remember, a cold burrito just does not cut it. Okay, all right. It, I, I see, okay, you're becoming animated, see? Auditory still refuse to say anything until they are properly fed. Now think of this. Hope is something we like to argue about. It's hope about your, your, your uh, athletic team. Any people are into football here? Okay, baseball. Okay, soccer. Basketball. And others, we are not to be involved in competitive sports. Amen. That's 17, page 111. <laughs> Some are anti-sports. Okay, that's okay. It's a free country. But you're into your garden, aren't you? Okay, see, I can hit off your fastball. See, baseball people understood that one. What is hope? How many of you have kids? Do you hope for your kids? Yeah. You know, that one son of mine, I'd like to just wrap him over the head, but I love my boy. I had a woman come to me, I need you to pray for my boy. He's not coming to church. He's, he's gone crazy. He's out in the world. I don't approve of his music. You need to pray for my boy. And I go, how old is your son? He's 67. You know, isn't that right, Mom? Doesn't matter how old he is, he'll always be your boy. My, my parents, I, I'm fortunate. I still have my parents. They're, they're, my mom's Alzheimer's is very advanced. Our time is very short that we have left with my mama. She's as cheerful as she could be. She knows what's going on. And she has conversations that we didn't get a thing out of, but she'll go ahead and say it all over again. And she's so cheerful because she says, son, when it's my time to go, I'm going to die smiling, and I want my children to remember that I died happy in Jesus. I may not know my grandchildren anymore. I don't know who my kids, my grandkids, and my, I keep calling your dad and your brother. Yeah, your brother over there has a lot to explain. I see my dad. My brother, yeah, you tell your brother. <laughs> my mom. My dad's dementia and his diabetes combination just 
has landed him at the Ukiah Hospital over and over and over. We know that one of these is his last run. I'm spoiled. I still have my parents. And I cherish what I have left. I don't ask for perfection. I just ask for my mom and my daddy to, to be comfortable and not suffer. And yesterday, before coming down here, my mom said, remember, you'll always be my boy, son. And my dad got stern. I don't care what they call you out there. Pastor, row husband, doctor, you know, around here, you're my boy. You understand? Yes, sir. You're around here, you don't teach me anything. I teach you everything. Yes, sir. <laughs> I used to change your diapers, young man. <laughs> That's been quite a while. No, it was recent. Ask your mom. You go try to argue with my daddy's dementia. And the, the nurse says, don't worry, these are his moments of confusion. Well, he seems pretty clear to me. <laughs> you see, my parents said, we still have hopes for you, son. We still hope for our kids. Isn't that right? Yeah. Doesn't matter how old your kids are, your grandkids, your great-grandkids, you still hope. Let's look at 1 Thessalonians chapter 4. Look briefly with me as we take out the Word of God. 1 Thessalonians chapter 4. The question is, what is hope? Okay, so 1 Thessalonians chapter 4 is a passage that pastors always read at a funeral. I don't know why there are certain passages we reserve for funerals. There are certain passages we, re we reserve only for Christmas. Why can't we talk about the birth of Jesus sometime in March? You should see when I play Christmas music in June. Why is he playing a Christmas song? This is camp meeting. Jesus can be celebrated at any time. Now you notice I keep talking. Why do I do that? Give you a time to find the passage. I go in circles. And because I, I want you to see it with your own eyes. So 1 Thessalonians chapter 4. <clears throat> now I want you to understand with me what Paul is saying here to the Thessalonians. The question is, what is hope? Verse 13, chapter 4 of 1 Thessalonians, verse 13 and onward. But I would not have you be ignorant, brothers and sisters, concerning them which are asleep. What is this sleep that's being referred to? The death. Those that we love that have passed on to their rest. It says, I don't want you to be ignorant about those which are asleep, so that you sorrow not, even as others who have no... There it is. Others who have no hope. Then look at the power of the next verse. For if we believe, <coughs> if we believe that Jesus died and rose again, even so them which are asleep in Jesus will God bring with him. We don't want you to be without hope because if we, there it is. What is hope? Hope is when you believe. So how many have kids? Do you believe in your kids? No matter how bad it gets, no matter how lost my child appears to be, I still believe in my kid. That is my flesh and blood. The devil cannot have my 67-year-old son. That is my boy. My mom will say, I carried him in this body. The devil cannot have my child. She will always hope because she believes. believes. That means hope and belief are synonymous. They are the same thing. If you stop believing, it's because you lost hope. If you don't have hope, it's because you don't believe. They go together. So a question this morning is, do you still believe? Amen, whatever it is. Others are saying, believe in what? Be more specific. Do you still believe? I'm eyeballing you. Do you still believe? Jesus said, look at me. 
Jesus said, all things are possible Amen. to them that believe. Do you believe? Well, good. The, the Ethiopian eunuch, there's some water. Can I be baptized? If you believe, you well may. My hope is built on nothing less than Jesus' blood and righteousness. I dare not trust the sweetest frame, but wholly lean on Jesus' name. On Christ the solid rock I stand, whole other ground is sinking sand. All other ground is sinking sand. How do the musicals feel? I don't care if he doesn't say anything else. I'm ready for closing prayer. <laughs> the auditories are intriguing. My hope is built on nothing less than Jesus' blood and righteousness. That is a solid concept theologically. You need to feel that kinesthetics to the depths of your soul. Visuals, can you see the power of hope? It's when you believe. Last night I referred to the National Football League team that I uh, follow, the Washington Redskins, that has been consistently in last place since Sister White. Well, last year we were second to the last. We go to the stadium, watch our team be ahead by 20 points at the half and still manage to lose the game by 15 at the end. We cheer for a while and then walk out sadly after each game. But we don't lose hope because we believe in our team. Well, there's always next season. We'll be back. <laughs> Look at you laughing at me. All these San Francisco 49ers and, and uh, Raiders fans and Rams fans, like these poor people from the East. <laughs> you see my point. Now, brothers and sisters, if we could be that silly over sports, imagine over truth, over our children, over our families and our futures. The power of hope is that you believe in something. We lose hope when we stop believing, brothers and sisters. Our young people are leaving the church in, in droves. Does that alarm you? We do not give up on our young people. Amen. And those of you who've been driving them away because of their music, you repent of your sin right now. Amen. Preserving the music of the church is not an identified ministry of this denomination. It is not scriptural. It was 19, or oh, was it, 36, that there was a preach-off hosted by the General Conference. We call it a preach-off, the pastors, where two pastors were to preach and one was to be selected in Chicago. In this corner was Elder Tucker of Sacramento, California, leading the Quiet Hour. In this corner from Syracuse, New York, HMS Richards Sr. leading the voice of prophecy. And the two men were to preach, and the general conference would pick one to be the official program of the general conference of 7th Avenue. Back then, there was no television. There was only radio. There were very few radios in the country. Adventist leaders were upset everywhere. The money should be going to publishing. Nobody cares about radios until World War II came and FDR began to have his fireside chats with the American people. One day when I was at the White House having breakfast with the president, I highly recommend the food. It's delicious. <laughs> when you come through town, just drop in. Uh, it was during the years that I was working there, and I. I went downstairs to the men's bathroom, uh, and it's in the president's library in the, in, in the east wing of the White House, uh, just down the hall from the First Lady's uh, suite of offices. 
And, and uh, across the hall is the China room where the ladies' bathroom is. And in this library, you see every book you ever imagined wishing you had at your house. Original signed volumes, hundreds of years old. And as I went to the, through the library, there's the fireplace. And there was Franklin Delano Roosevelt's rocking chair. And I just stood there. He sat right here and had fireside chats with the American people and kept us together and inspired during the height of World War II. I touched the chair and I wasn't gonna sit in it because it was more urgent that I get into the men's restroom. <laughs> so I went in about and took care of my business. And I'm inside the bathroom, I wash my hands and I notice the towels, they're paper towels, but they look like cloth. And, and they have the president's seal stamped in gold. Well, I dried my hands inside my jacket. I'm not gonna ruin this towel. This towel is going home. <laughs> Does that sound like a poor Latino from Central California Conference to you? I tell you, these Spanish people will stoop to just about anything. I have a whole collection of White House towels at the house. I'm sure you want to work a deal for one of them, right? <laughs> I'm not going to waste a good towel on just wet hands. I started lining my jacket pockets with stuff to make sure I was nice and dry before I got a collection of towels. <laughs> I can't believe I just admitted that publicly <laughs> with cameras rolling. What a lack of decorum. President knew about it. He didn't care. He said, so you like my towel? Yes, sir. <laughs> Whenever I get low on my mortgage, I'll just sell a few of them on eBay. <laughs> I was probably the joke at the White House. <laughs> anyway, isn't that something? I haven't forgotten who I am. I am the son of peasants, and I serve the Lord with gladness. Amen. Don't forget who you are. You're a farmer's son, daughter. You're a city slicker's son or daughter. Don't forget who you are. Don't stop being who you are. Wear truth in the armor God gave you. Amen. Does that make sense? Yeah. Notice how I don't hold anything back. You're going to Google me anyway. <laughs> You'll find out my stuff anyway. I've decided I'm no longer a young man. Now, for you, a bunch of you, I'm still a young man. Some of you were my teachers. I'm still a kid. But I'm not a young man anymore, and I'm too young to be this tired. And I, I am, I'm offered positions again at the General Conference, and I'm not a policy person, although I can do policy very well. I had an office in Congress for four years. But you know, I'd rather be on the ground face to face with God's people. I'm like General Patton. I want to be in my Jeep with my little helmet with my little sidearm at the front lines. I'm not a Pentagon general. I'm out here on the ground. I'm not a good man. That's just my passion, to be here with you, because I still believe in something. I have not lost my hope, because hope is a good thing, ladies and gentlemen. Do you have hope? Well, I'm not sure if I believe in the Sabbath anymore. No wonder you're losing hope. You're stopping your belief process. Continue to believe that Christ is the same today, tomorrow, and forever. Jesus Christ in me, the hope of glory. So what is hope? When you believe in something, and if you believe, will you ever lose hope? Don't you ever lose hope again. Well, I've just been confused. Get over it. I've been, dis you know, the Adventist term is, I've been discouraged. That is the term we love. I've been, I've been discouraged. What you're saying is, I've been harboring doubt. The Bible says this. Yeah, I know, but it was meant for another time. You know, I just read this, and I don't think it applies today. Who asked you for your opinion? The Word of God says it. I believe it. How did the song say? 
That settles it for me. Any, any questions? You want to step outside? I'll pray with you about this. You see, as long as we harbor doubt, then we're not complete. We begin to lose hope. That's why never lose hope. Your belief will remain strong. Because in this series of 9 a.m. today, 11 a.m. coming up, and, and at 2 p.m. today, these three go together. You can't miss them. I've messed you up. Now, we were going to go to the book deal at 11. Now we're stuck having to come back. I messed you up, huh? Well, if you messed me up and put 15 sermons on me this week, you, you deserve every bit. Notice I hold nothing back. You know my humanity. You've known me since I was 15 years old. What am I going to pretend to be with you? You know this boy. So let's quit our pretensions. We're in this together. Jesus is coming again, and we're not ready. That's not acceptable. That's not part of prophecy. If not one in 20, we're ready in 1907. What's that number today? It's time for the math to change because God's people begin to hope in something again. It all begins with hope. What do you believe in? I'm a Seventh-day Adventist. What are you? Well, I'm culturally oriented, but I... The moment you need to add the word but, you've given yourself an out. I like when people clarify it to me. Elder Rojas, I love how you preach, but... <laughs> now let me tell you the real truth. <laughs> I... I, I I, I, I sometimes don't know what else to say. I wish I had an angelic capacity to communicate, but I don't. I'm just a broken human being, and I'm doing the best I can to share what's sitting here based on traveling the planet. I just confirmed Tasmania last, yesterday. Camp meeting, they call it Tassie. I didn't know that. The land of Oz, Australia. And they say, you got to come down to Tassie because our camp meeting is going to be held in a town where the church is dying. The purpose of camp meeting is to rebuild the church in that town. And we're going to go there to evangelize for our camp meeting. Can you come and preach your head off at, at, in this town? And I said, yeah. How inspiring. They say, all right, we, we have 10 members left at that church. We are praying for 100 members when we leave town. Amen. Do you still believe? Yes. Or is that just, well, third world countries, they fall into the baptistry all by themselves. <laughs> I know that's what you're thinking. But they should come to Tulare and see the real world, right? Just come out to San Jose and we'll show you what the reality is in America. How dare we tell the Holy Spirit what's possible and what's impossible? Who do we think we are to be the authority on who responds to truth and who doesn't? The Holy Spirit can do his work well, thank you. The Lord is just looking for people who believe, who do not harbor doubts, who are filled with the latter rain of the Holy Spirit to go do something that cannot be done. I'm in shock at the stuff that comes out of my mouth, usually quite embarrassing. But there are moments that my kids have sat me down, Dad, you got to listen, you got to see, no, don't make me watch myself. I teach public speaking, I break every rule of presentation. It's terrible to watch myself. I, I, I can't take my, I, I can't stand my style. I can only imagine you. And my kids say, but you got to watch, Papi. You've been preaching for 42 years. That's older than any of us. We grew up. The only memory we have is our dad preaching. And we're all young adults now in our 20s and 30s, having our own kids. And we freaked out when we saw this. And they made me watch myself. <laughs> Shh, dad, stop it. Now listen. And I couldn't believe. Wait, 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 wait. Rewind it. Uh-huh, see? I don't remember saying that. Rewind it again. 
That's not in my notes. I memorize my outlines. I, I, I rehearse carefully. I, there's nothing left to chance. This is a specific, measurable science of homiletics. Wait, 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 wait. Rewind that. I don't remember saying that either. Bring me some paper and, and a pen, and I begin to take notes on my own message. I know some of you, especially you auditories, you see, I told you, he just wings it. <laughs> he just floats along. No, I'm going to say publicly something here that you don't have to believe. I've begun to learn from my own messages. That is frightening. When you, when you hear something come out of your mouth, that you know cannot possibly be you. I am confessing publicly for the first time. I've begun to learn from my own messages. So you tell me what the Holy Spirit's able to do because God can take broken people and still accomplish a divine thing. God is not waiting for us to finish his work. He promised to finish his work. He simply has chosen to finish his work through us. Jesus said, you shall be my witnesses. What is a witness? A person who knocks on a door and hands out. No, that's, that's Adventist liturgy. liturgy. That's a cultural term, witnessing. No, 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 that, that's door-to-door -door work. I lived in Campbell a short time, did literature evangelism. Then I went to Mission District in San Francisco and did literature evangelism. You've dealt with me in the Bay Area. You know you called the cops when you saw me. <laughs> I don't know, something frightening is knocking on our door. <laughs> I'm telling you, I'm now seeing miracles on a routine basis around the planet. I was preaching in Villahermosa, Tabasco, Mexico, and it was 114 degrees at 8 p.m. in the outdoor stadium with humidity. Jaguars are dying in the jungle. I mean, I had never soaked a suit in my life, and it's being televised live. Sisters put makeup on me. That was a mess. After that, I said, I don't want any makeup. I'd rather look pale and dead while on screen than to look pale and dead and squished with makeup in my eyes. And 3ABN was saying, you got to do something about your face. We're running this live. <laughs> and there was nothing I can do about this face. Anyway, <laughs> some things are permanent. See the kinesthetics? Oh, he's so cute about everything. See, but the auditories, I wish he'd just stick to his point. And, and the visuals are, I can see him sweating away in the state. See what I'm doing? I'm trying to feed as many as possible. So you got to be patient when it's the other person's turn to receive for a few seconds. See how it goes? I'm giving away my secrets. When I go to my grave to, to await the coming of Jesus, I want to be completely satisfied that I gave away everything I could that I saw on the way. You see, Jesus said, you shall be my witnesses. A witness is somebody who sees somebody else do something. That's a witness. When you're reduced to watching, oh, that's what my life has become. I've been reduced to watching God use me to do stuff that there's no way that I could be prepared for. I cannot explain to you. I was preaching up here at a church, and, and, and the, the church has the door right up to the sidewalk, and you can see people walking by during the services, you know? They're, they're walking through the open door, past the open door, the sidewalk out in the street, and all of a sudden, a gentleman did this, and he cocked his head. Once you get a human being to do this, the way a doggy does, they're coming in. He was intrigued to no end, and he came in, and he just kind of elbowed his way in through all those sweet ladies, welcome, excuse me. Came in and sat down, and I watched him as I preached, and then, and then when it was done, he says, I gotta I got talk to you. He walked up to me, and I didn't understand a word he was saying. So one of the sisters there happened to be Russian. She says, he's speaking Russian. 
and, and I said, well, translate for me. He said, I was walking by, and I heard Mother Russian from, with a Moscow accent coming out of your mouth. I had to come in. This Latino was <laughs> trying to absorb this moment. Well, I, I, I do not speak Russian. He says, yes, you do. You have the accent of Moscow. So I was reduced to being a witness. You shall be my witness. You see, have I been trained to speak Russian spontaneously with a Moscow accent, not a St. Petersburg accent or a Ukrainian accent? No. The Holy Spirit can do His work. Are we, do we believe? Or have we lost hope? You follow the point. Do we believe? Yeah. All things are possible to them that believe. How many things? Oh. Well, most things if you are faithful. No, do not put qualifiers. Do you believe? Yeah. All things are possible to them that believe. Is this work going to get finished or not? Are we going to let the Lord finish the work and use us as witnesses to watch him do his stuff through us and be reduced to rewind that thing, bring me a paper. Even I am learning from my own messages. Nobody's that good. Only God is that good. So if you are new to this faith, hold on and never let go. If the Lord is calling you to this faith, it is time to be baptized and join the movement. God promised us a final movement. So, like we say on the streets, what you gonna do about it? You just gonna sit there, hey, amen, that was a wonderful message. Now remember, you're never gonna remember what I said today. It was incredible, you should have been there. What was it about? I forgot, but it was incredible. <laughs> I'm gonna buy the tape. Remember this, I'm going to give you another secret. People will not ever forget. The, the, people will forget what you say, but they will never forget how you made them feel. So if this morning you feel convicted, called by God, this is your moment of hope. You want to make something of it? Never let go of his hand. Amen. We're starting with grandchildren now. A child is happy as long as they get to hold on to an adult hand or skirt or something. Security is in holding on to a hand. Come on, sweetheart. Okay, Gamma. You know, when you go to the swap meet, You don't just go to Macy's. Admit it, you go to swap meets too. That flea market outside of Gilroy. Come on, come on. When you drive all the way up to, what's it up there above Lodi? Uh, uh, Galt. I've seen a bunch of Adventists when I go to Galt. Look at all these wealthy people <laughs> getting their deals at Galt. How does a child find their joy? Holding on. Come on, sweetheart. This is lots of fun. You want to see a child in terror? Let go of their hand and go one row over so they can't see you. What's going to happen to that child? Horror, unspeakable horror. So you and I never let go of his hand. We are his sheep, the people of his pastures. We enter into his gates with thanksgiving, into his courts with praise. We are thankful unto him. We bless his name, for the Lord is good. His mercy is everlasting, and his truth endures for all generations. Do you believe? You got to come back at 11, because the question is going to be, what is faith? This was what is belief. I mean, what is hope? Then the next one is going to be, 
what is faith? And you may think you know what it is. There'll always be a scholar. I already knew that. <laughs> I heard you present this at Southern University in 1987. <laughs> what, is, what is faith at 11? And then at 2 o'clock, what is love? So I'm going to hit you with all three barrels. Don't worry, it's a 16-gauge. 12 is just too big to pull out at camp meeting. Why don't we stand together? <clears throat> now, for you musicals, we already sang, my hope is built. On, see, musicals have already been fed, right? It, do you find this interesting? That, I, mean, I mean, is it helpful? Uh, that I'm giving away my secrets. Who are the four people I talk to? The kinesthetics, the auditories, the, emo the, the visuals, and the musicals. And how old are they? Nine years old. Your stuff, no matter how deep it is, should be so simple that even a child can understand it. And, and the depth is only brain deep. The applicability is what a child is looking for. So now I'm, I'm, I'm here to provoke you. I'm not here to please you. Some of you are still insisting I need to shave. If I would just take off two inches, I'd be... <sighs> but it's not going to happen. <laughs> I'm just one broken human being. Uh, but you know what? The Lord is showing us that anybody can be used in the hands of God to see something divine happen in our midst. So you must walk away from this series today with renewed hope because, again, you have come to believe. Let's bow our heads. Father in heaven, thank you so much for each one of us here at camp meeting this year. It is not a coincidence that we're here at such a time as this with our planet literally, actually, measurably in toil. We are now needing a revival and a reformation amongst us such as never before seen in our history. It is time Renew our hope. Give us a reason to believe again. Provoke us to thought today and bring us back. In the name of Jesus, we ask, and all God's people said, Amen. Go, tell someone what you have seen. We would like to thank the constituency of the Central California Conference of the Seventh-day Adventist Church for making this program possible and from viewers just like you. Thank you.